Welcome to EWTN Live. I'm Father Mitch Packle, and this is a program where we bring you guests from around the world. Tonight, we will look back at some of the founding principles of the United States of America. Why were they important back then at the founding? And can those principles survive? And can the country survive now, 244 years after the founding? We're up against the cancel culture of today and the cultural Marxist groups that seek to erase and rewrite America's history. Can we stand up to that? Our guest tonight is an author and an expert on American foreign policy. He was a special assistant to Ronald Reagan during the president's first term. And he is currently director of the Westminster Institute and the author of a new book, America on Trial, A Defense of the Founding. So joining us tonight via Skype from Vienna, Virginia, please welcome Mr. Robert R. Riley. Robert, welcome back. It's wonderful to be with you again. Great to be with you, Father, but not as much fun as being with you in person. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, we miss that, but, you know, um, these <clears throat> days are not the time to be flying around the country, unfortunately. But we're still glad to be able to see you and hear you. And this is a, a, an issue that has been percolating in our country for some time. There um, are a lot of challenges f to our American history. Uh, one very much used book, very popular book, is called A People's History of the United States. It's used in a lot of our schools. And it is very much attacking foundations of the country. And it moves along to proposing a socialist and or straight up Marxist interpretation of the solution of the country and its refounding. A lot of people are picking up on that and promoting these ideas. It's what they're taught in the school, especially in the public school system. You are doing something different. You want us to go back in history. Tell us a little bit about this history so that we can look at real history and see our roots. Well, of course, it's not only the book to which you refer, but the uh, notorious 1619 project uh, yeah. sponsored by New York Times Magazine, which mm -hmm. is now being foisted in schools. And um, its position, of course, is that uh, DNA was in uh, America's system from the beginning, uh, before the beginning, in 1619, when the first black slaves arrived here. And all of this, ironically, is to take down the country that is animated by the moral principle that all men are created equal, mm -hmm. which led to the abolition of slavery here. Mm -hmm. Why would you wish to destroy the very country which led to its abolition. This is one of the ironies that we can address. And of course, you touch upon it when you speak of the pseudo-Marxist-Leninist principles that animate so much of this. Mm -hmm. They have a, either a class theory of history or a race theory of history. The United States wasn't based upon a theory of history. It was based upon certain immutable principles, transcendent principles of and the laws of nature and of nature's God and of a creator God who instilled in man these inalienable rights to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Now, the, the question I ask in my book is from where did the ideas come that made the United States conceivable in the first place? 
They didn't pop out of thin air. No. Where? Where? And this takes us on a big historical adventure in this book. In order to appreciate it, and, and by the way, to help us understand what's happening in the streets of the United States today and elsewhere, this intellectual adventure begins in the pre-philosophic world, before philosophy, before classical Greeks, before the uh, revelation of one God in Israel, uh, before Christianity, in the life of tribal man. What was that like? Uh, it was a life centered upon one's immediate tribe. The head of the tribe usually had some sort of divine connection with the gods of the tribe whose, whose uh, function was to uh, help the, the, the tribe win its battles and its wars and subdue its enemies and to bring the harvest in or success in the hunt. There was no mental conception through which one tribal member could understand someone from another tribe as a human being. Uh, there wasn't the word human being didn't exist. Uh, the word nature didn't exist. There were no laws of nature. They didn't even know there there were essences. So that if someone uh, won in war, conquered a city, uh, the modus vivendi was to kill all the men and enslave all the women and children. Uh, no one in the conquered city w could have thought of a moral objection to this have happening to them because they would have done it to their opponents had they won. There, were, there was no moral discourse to allow uh, no. any uh, opposition to this kind of thing. It, then, of course... As a matter of fact, but, one of the things to, to add, in the ancient world, uh, if you did not enslave the enemies, you had to kill all of them. In their mindset, enslaving the women and children was as much mercy as you could be allowed to show to the conquered because the conquered had a moral obligation to get back at you. Revenge and destruction of your enemies was the only law that worked. There was no such thing as resettlement programs, prison camps, none of that existed. It was, I kill you or I enslave you. Those are your options. And slavery was preferred by the survivors. Often, not always, but often they was preferred. And, that, that's this, and it's all over the world that way. That was the norm almost everywhere. And there was no moral discourse through which anyone could no. object to slavery. It, it no. didn't occur to men. Now, you know, of course, through your extensive experience in the Middle East, that the tribal mind still exists. Yeah. There are still tribes in the world today who behave this way. Yep. Now, well, how did we get from the tribal mind to what we might call a civilized mind? That's not a term of, of derogation as it would take it to be taken to be today. It simply meant that what enabled a, a man to recognize another man as a human being, even if he belonged to another tribe. How did, where did that come from? We know where it came, it came from the dawn of philosophy in classical Greece when a conception arose of such a thing as a nature which made something what it is according to its essence, according to the end for which it was. And one could see that as much as one might despise the Spartan, the Spartan was actually a human being in every much the same way as you were. And that um, as, as this kind of thinking developed, that there were natural laws by which one ought to behave in one's moral life, that is, those types of behavior which would uh, bring you to the fulfillment of your nature as a human being, as a rational creature. 
and what what was that thing principally, as we know from Aristotle and his Nicomachean ethics, was a life of virtue. It was virtue which perfected man in his nature, which is his rational nature. In fact, as you know, virtue was the prerequisite for philosophy, for thinking clearly. Otherwise, you would be compromised by the rationalizations you would be living uh, in to justify the vice. So the truth of things, that men could come to know the truth of things as opposed to just having opinions about them, that we can make these distinctions, we can apprehend this reality, and lo and behold, in examining the world, it seems to be ordered rationally. How, how come it has these laws, and how come it behaves according to them? And the pre-Socratic philosophers, um, I think specifically of Heraclitus here, maybe Anaximander, mm -hmm. so there's got to be, behind this order we see in nature, a divine intelligence of which it's an expression. And for the first time, the word to describe this divine intelligence was logos, mm -hmm. the Greek word for reason or word. It was the divine logos that was behind the order of reality that made it apprehensible by our reason. And um, if I could just help folks to see how significant that is, when you read er earlier works, the, the first written Greek texts were mythology, Hesiod and his Theogony and the Iliad and the Odyssey. These are written down, and you see that from the tribal society, the gods and goddesses acted on the basis of their own vices. They were acting on the basis of envy, jealousy, anger, revenge, and they controlled history on that basis. These philosophers that you mentioned, like Heraclitus and Anaximander, they are going beyond that. They're saying, that can't be real. He's arguing against those tribal gods, and they are trying to understand there's something more basic and true than these petty jealousies, angers, murders, rapes, all these stories of the gods. There's something more real than that. And that's where they, they're thinking these principles through. And then, in fact, as you know, Socrates made the claim that there is a higher justice that's above the justice of the city, uh, that something that's just everywhere and at all times for all men. Mm -hmm. And this was considered an act of impiety because... The gods of the city are the ones who got to decide what's just and for this city, whereas the other city had different gods and also a different conception of justice. Right. And, of course, he was executed for impiety, as, as we know. So we see bubbling up in, through man's exercise of his reason and philosophy the apprehension of these truths. Now, let's put that on the side for just a moment and go to uh, the ancient Israelites, uh, adrift in a sea of pantheism in the ancient Middle East. All the religions were pantheistic, polytheistic, uh, seeped in superstition and, and animal and sometimes human sacrifices. Um, and this one tribe peculiarly, astonishingly insists that, no, no, there aren't any gods, there's only one. And even more astonishingly says, this god is transcendent, he exists outside of this world, beyond it. But ancient man had no conception of anything being outside the universe. Exactly. So, so folks understand, when you say that it's pantheistic, some religions in the ancient world believed everything is God. 
other religions believed in polytheism, that there are multiple gods, but usually their gods were the forces of nature that were deified. So there was a god that was the sun, a god who is the moon, a god who is the storm, god of the wind, and so on. And Israel is not like anybody else in that ancient world. Nobody has that kind of transcendent belief in God who's beyond, he created nature, but nature is not God. That was key. And one might also say that ancient man lived with this inherent sense of futility because he was just a plaything of the gods. Right. He was here today, he was gone tomorrow. Uh, he was in, entirely disposable and of no inherent significance. Uh, except it, even worse, something that very important. In the Babylonian and Akkadian mythology and Sumer, the gods created human beings to be their slaves. That in the Enuma Elish, you see that humans are the slaves of the gods. That is totally different than being made in the image and likeness of God. Radically that's, different. That's, that's the other astonishing thing in Genesis. Not only does God create all these things, and as the refrain after every day says so majestically, and God saw that it was good, Everything he made was good, as, as you were referring to these ancient mythologies. Uh, the, the world isn't the field of contestation between a demo, a, an evil demiurge and a good demiurge that are fighting it out. And therefore, the order uh, around us is constantly imperiled. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep sacrificing to placate the angry god or demiurge. But no, no, everything God made is good. And then, of course, what was especially good was this creature, man, whom he made in his own image and likeness. Again, totally unique revelation that now we see in man himself something that makes him inviolable and sacrosanct. Right. Exactly. So this, again, it, 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 revolutionary. One cannot account for the character of Jewish revelation by anything around it. It, it, is, it is astonishingly unique, and I don't think that you would argue with me if I, if I said Genesis is the basis of our civilization. I, 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 would, would, I, I would not only not argue with you, I would agree with you. <laughs> I would go even further and say that any one today who is promoting human rights, complaining about human rights abuses, uh, who, who they, they may not be Jewish, they may not be Christian, but they nonetheless are beneficiaries of Genesis yep. and the revelation of the Imago Dei in man. Now, as you know, Judaism was a tribal religion the, the irony, it had a universal God, but was a tribal religion, what, though with a salvific mission for all of mankind. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is the other thing, because of creation in Genesis, we see history erupting in time for the first time. As you know, in the ancient world, in the pantheistic world, time is circular. There's no beginning, middle, end. It's a loop. And right. this loop adds to the sense of futility. All is vain and futile. Uh, all of a sudden, now we know, well, no, the universe had a beginning. Mm -hmm. We're somewhere in the middle. It will have an end. And we know that this Yahweh, this transcendent God, let's say loved creation into being. He's a provident God who enters his creation uh, for purposes of his providence. And then, of course, promises 
as a solution to the evil that has so marred creation, a Messiah. Then we have the, the most revolutionary uh, occurrence in human history, which is the Incarnation, where the truths of the Jewish religion are now universalized. Now this universal God is in a universal religion, and you see within Christianity the assimilation of this gift of philosophy, what the Benedict XVI calls the gift of the Greeks. And through the enrichment of this reason, we can come to even a deeper understanding of the profound truths of the revelation in the Old and New Testaments. Exactly. And, and as you know, of course, as the universal religion, Christianity had to address itself not just to Jews, but to the Gentiles. And how was it going to speak to that world, which was a Hellenized world? Now we, we recall Heraclitus's use of the word logos, and we know the electrifying beginning of the Gospel of St. John, and the beginning was the word, the beginning was the logos, and the logos was God. And the Logos was God. All things were made through him as Logos. So God introduces himself as the Logos, as reason. Right. Now, right. now we know why we have this rational order, why our reason can apprehend the order, because because God himself is, is that reason. Uh and, uh, but on top of which, you've, you, you've got the providential aspect of, of Jewish religion now fully revealed in the infinite love of God for man through Christ and his saving grace. That this imago dei, this, this inviolable individual, is, as a person, each person, the object of infinite love all the more than inviolable because of it, and that in Christ the mystery of man is revealed, that his ultimate destiny is to share in the inner life of God itself, to be, to share in his divine life, to be divinized. Now, these, these three tributaries, I mean, it's, it, these were the bedrocks without which there would not have been such a thing as the American founding. And in the rest of the book, I build upon that to show why. And, and one of the things that I, I think is very important uh, to show why understanding these roots in ancient Israel, these roots in Christianity, and the roots in the uh, Greek tradition of reason and philosophy is that right before the revolution, there had been a period known as the first great awakening. There was a major religious revival. It was a, obviously a Protestant revival because there were very few Catholics in the colonies. But that religious revival in the, the colonies in the 1700s came before the revolution. And these thoughts of the importance of being made in God's image and treating our nature before the transcendent God and dealing with the reality of this, was extremely important in the minds of people. And that along with, and this is one of the great things, when you study the founders, some of, some of these folks are saying, well, it's how many slaves they had and so on. You also have to look at Thomas Jefferson's library, where you see the ancient histories the ancient philosophers, the modern philosophers, of modern by his day, uh, all of these ideas are studied by him. They're studied by people like um, uh, 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 John Adams, 
uh, when he went to Harvard, this, this was not just you picking these ideas out of past history and putting them into your book. This was part of the way they thought and studied and believed at the time of the founding. And to understand them, you need to understand this historical background that they imbibed. They were reading Livy and all the others in Latin. They're reading them in Greek. They're reading philosophers in German and French. They, they knew these original languages and studied. So you, I, I just want to emphasize that because the Christian, Israelite, and philosophical background was the world of the founders. And that applied to slave owners and those who were not slave owners. It was a common Absolutely. worldview. And some of them, as you know, read Hebrew as well. Yep. Absolutely. Now, the, the, so far as we have gotten, and you just jumped ahead a couple of millennium, which is fine, millennia, which is fine, uh, because we just got to the cusp of how it is the man developed the moral vocabulary to know that you're not supposed to abuse another human being. Um, that you can recognize them as a human being, but that you also know they're of infinite worth and their person is inviolable. Uh, w without that understanding, there would have developed no moral objection to uh, slavery. And as you pointed at the beginning of the show, slavery was uh, omnipresent in history. Yeah. It existed everywhere and for almost all times. Now, at the time of the American founding, all the leading founders thought that slavery was a profound immorality, both for Christian reasons and for philosophical reasons. No one wrote in in more impassioned way against slavery than Jefferson, who, of course, did have slaves. Washington knew it. They all knew it. And that is why they created a country based upon the moral principle that all people are created equal. They didn't know how they were going to get rid of slavery in, in the short run. They were hoping that it, it could resolve itself peacefully over some years. No one knew what to do with it or how to extirpate it in, in some reasonable, prudential fashion. But that it had to be, they knew it, and that's why they dedicated a country to that proposition, and that all men have this inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the, the, what you'll hear from the 1619 Project and others who malign our country today is that, oh, that only meant white men, didn't mean black men. That's a calumny against the founding. It's absolutely not true. And, you know, I could, I could go to the uh, Confederacy to prove it wasn't true, because the, in the famous cornerstone speech of the, the vice president of the Confederacy, uh, made it clear that the Confederacy was necessary to embody the principle that uh, uh, black people are slaves by nature, uh, and uh, as against that false teaching in the Declaration of Independence. And he specifically says, all the people at the time thought it was evil, thought it was a violation of human rights. Now, we know that that's the false teaching and that slavery is the true teaching. So it, it is. And, and if Sorry. I could add, if I could add at, at this point, that the teaching that slavery of African descent people is what they deserve, that they are inherently inferior, was not in the founding. This was a decision by the Supreme Court 
In the Dred Scott decision, Roger Tawney wrote the majority opinion stating that blacks could not be citizens, they should not be free because they are inherently inferior. It is as evil a decision from the Supreme Court as was the decision of the Supreme Court to make abortion legal. Both of them denied human rights and dignity that had been granted in the founding. Now, Robert, I have to take a break right now. We will come back and pick up on this, so please stay with us, all of you. with Robert R. Riley discussing his book called America on Trial, A Defense of the Founding. We're making this available at EWTN Religious Catalog. You can go to EWTNRC.com. It is item number 9489. I want to urge our audience to look at this because right now a good deal of the discourse that we hear in the by pundits and other folks commenting on the politics a good deal of that discourse depends on you not knowing the information that Riley has gathered for you Robert has pulled together an historical background so that you can have a basis in fact for, for being able to defend what it means to have these principles. So I want to urge you all to get these and think about these issues. One, one of the things that you also do, besides talking about these most basic principles that brought us away from a tribal mentality into a rational understanding with basis and belief in the transcendent God and human dignity as inherently given by God. And, not, and importantly, not mediated by the state. The state does not give you dignity and therefore it can't take it away. God gives it to you, and it's yours permanently. You also go back to the importance of Greek and Roman history and other developments. Do we have, we, you know, we've, we don't have a whole lot of time, but I'd like us to at least cover some of that and maybe contrast the American Revolution with, say, the French. But, Father, you mentioned something so critically important. I wish I had uh, brought it out earlier, but mm -hmm. I'm glad you did mention it. And that is the other impact of Christianity was to forever demote the importance of the political. Yes. Because man's salvation came through Christ, not through the ruler, not through the state. Without that truth, there would never have been a separation between church and state. The state was considered a divine. The ruler was certainly considered divine or semi-divine, and it was only one's access to the ruler that made one's prayers heard by the god or gods. Now, it was the individual who had a relationship with his Savior, Christ, without the state interposing itself. Therefore, the state was diminished, shrunk to size. 
without this having happened, I don't think there you wouldn't have anything like a, a, a constitutional limited government, separation of powers, it, it, it freedom of religion, et cetera, mm -hmm. as we have now. Yep, I think that's right. And one part of the proof of this pudding is that when people propose that the state is the arbiter and the giver of rights, they have to attack religion. So Marx said that religion is the opiate of the people, and they have to go after religion, and then when they get power, they attack the churches, the synagogues, the mosques. They attack the religious institutions, and they have to undo all of that in order to get total control under the state. We see that going on as a temptation as some of these folks who are trying to refound the country and redefine it are attacking religious symbols and institutions and statues of the saints and burning churches. They, they, they have an impulse to attack Christianity and God. And this is something to pay co close attention to these days. Well, I think uh, the prototype for that was the French Revolution. Yes. And you mentioned the comparison between that and the American Revolution. The, the, the Jacobin aspect of the French Revolution was premised on man's perfectibility. Man could perfect himself. Right. Uh, here and now through his own powers, or rather through the powers of the state. And the principal obstacle to man's self-perfection was you, in short, Father, the church. It's all my and fault. It's all, all fault. my fault. And therefore, um, the French Revolution undertook a radical de-Christianization campaign, knocking the crosses off of cemeteries, <clears throat> confiscating church property, uh, sending uh, 25,000 priests into exile, executing others, executing nuns. Um, all one has to ask one's, because that's the principal obstacle to the project of self-perfection, is the church, which offers perfection indeed, but it's only in Christ's mercy and love and by conforming oneself to his will. It, well, as a matter American, of fact... I'd, I'd like to quote one of the French philosophers who said, the revolution cannot end until every king is hung by the entrails of the last priest. That they want to get rid of the kings and use the entrails, the intestines of priests to hang them with. I don't know how strong they think our intestines are, but... This was their way of trying to destroy the monarchy and the church to promote their revolution. Yeah, and beyond that, the Marquis de Sade said, it's, it's not enough to kill the king. We have to kill God. Yes. Now, in the American Revolution, uh, one can ask oneself, would it have been conceivable for there to be a de-Christianization campaign in that revolution? Of course not because it was a revolution by Christians, uh, all of whom accepted the original sin, that man wasn't his own savior, uh, that the only hope of salvation was in Christ, and that therefore wanted a limited government that couldn't presume to become man's savior. Now, I think, Father, what we're seeing today in the streets, and you alluded to this, are young people and others who think they already should be perfect. And the reason they're not is someone else's fault or some institution's fault. And therefore, they must attack those people and tear down those institutions. So they're animated by this sense of grievance, not by contrition at their own sins, by the need of moral, spiritual reform and prayer and hope in Christ, no, no, by, by this 
act of destruction, which we saw in such a prototypical way in the French Revolution. Yep. Now they're hoping that they can make the American Revolution into the French Revolution, whereas back at that time in the 18th century, they were really antithetical to each other. Yep, yep. And, you know, this is something that, um, you know, we, we oftentimes heard that one of the reasons the people of the Enlightenment period, the late 1600s and into the 1700s, what they said about religion is that it was the greatest cause of war in history. And that's one of the reasons they would give for opposing religion. Whereas, in reality, the number of people who had died in Christian wars, including the Crusades, the Thirty Year War, et cetera, the number of people who had died was two and a quarter million people. While in the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, it was closer to three million people died in 20 years, as opposed to what it, those who had died in 1800 years before that in Christian wars. In other words, they say that they were trying to prevent wars of religion, but they created wars that were worse than all those religious wars combined. But the other thing to recall is that the greatest body count in the 20th century, as horrible as World War uh, I and II were, uh, was not from war. It That's was right. from regimes killing their own people. <laughs> the, the scores of millions killed in the Soviet Union, killed in communist China, killed by the Khmer Rouge, et cetera, and so forth. These are wars by a regime against their own people, not in wars against another nation. And again, for the same reason, we're going to perfect ourselves once we get rid of the bourgeoisie, once we get rid of that class of people, and so forth. Yeah, it was the, K, the, first. the KGB admitted in 92 that, they, that the Soviet Union had killed 61.9 million of its own people. And China may be about 75 million in the name of atheistic government. And the, the thing to point out with that is while the 1610, or 1619, sorry, the 1619 project is dealing with, you know, slavery as the original sin, I fear that they may end up enslaving people along the lines of those who had said, we got to free people from religious war, and then they created worse wars. You oftentimes become that which you state as you oppose. And this is a human problem, that you define yourself by what you're against, instead of defining yourself by what you are in favor of. And this is a real concern as we see our cities on fire and being made ugly with graffiti and destruction and with more African Americans being killed in these riots than were killed by the police. This is something that we have to pay close attention to. I think you're right. I think that, uh, by the way, the 1619 Project neglects something that's very important, and that is that slavery didn't arrive in uh, the American hemisphere uh, in 1619, but had been practiced by the Native Americans for centuries and centuries before and for centuries afterward. Why? Yeah. Not it, because they were tribal, just as you and I discussed the tribal mind. That's what tribes do. And what you just described happening uh, in our streets with Antifa and these other violent groups is they're re-tribalizing 
the United yes. States. They're breaking us down into color, into gender, into race, into economic strata, and uh, seeing whether you deserve to be attacked or not attacked, whether you deserve to have your property destroyed or not destroyed. What happened to equal rights? What happened to the Imago Dei? What happened to the principles of the Declaration of Independence? What happened to the rule of law as the rule of reason? This is the pure law of will and power, and it will end as, if it, they're allowed to get the upper hand, it will end as badly as all of the other things you just mentioned. And it even goes to a point where the foundresses of Black Lives Matter are looking to spiritism as their, they say this must be a spiritual movement as much as a political movement. And their spiritual model comes from a type of tribal spiritism that calls on the dead in order to get their power in the present. And this is, again, opening up for other issues that, as Christians, we have to say, yes, I want to make sure that all African Americans are treated equally under the law. I do not want any racial group to be treated differently than any other racial group. And equal protection under the law must be the law of the land. But I don't believe that retribalizing religious practice will be the way that leads to that. It'll be the opposite. Well, you know, Father, that um, there was uh, religious freedom in this country, uh, obviously enunciated in the Constitution, but that did not mean just any religion. It didn't mean the Aztecs could reopen shop in New Orleans and start ripping out human hearts to placate the, the angry gods. It meant only those religions that were compatible with the universal transcendent truths contained in the preamble to the Declaration, that all men are created equal, uh, that they're endowed by their creator with these inalienable rights. Now, if your religion doesn't allow you to say that, well, then you're, you're really not welcome because you can't live within a constitutional regime. And if, if, if you're re-tribalizing us, that means you, you can't either because a successful re-tribalization would be premised on the destruction of the Constitution based upon the principles in the Declaration. And something, again, a lot of folks may not be aware of this, but in the universities, there are open and public attacks on using reason. The use of reason is attacked as an imposition from the past or as a male-oriented power device or as a bad philosophy. And the, it, it comes from the deconstruction school of philosophy. It is very common in English departments, English uh, literature departments. And it's showing up in the rejection of rational arguments against their positions. And it's that regrounding tribal mentality moving away from Christian and Israelite religion, moving away from reason, moving away from actual history and principles to something that becomes arbitrary and tribal. Yeah, as, as we saw at the beginning, that the Western civilization was born of an appreciation for the primacy of reason, 
over the primacy of will and power. Mm -hmm. Now, this effort to delegitimize reason, to say, oh, that's this product of this colonial, corrupt Western culture, uh, what we want is unreason. Well, then you're going to have the primacy of will and power. And good luck to you. Mm -hmm. Won't be good luck. You know, it's, yeah, it's okay. a very interesting thing to me. Um, for instance, in reading the uh, people's history of the United States, there's a strong criticism of the early enslavement of Native Americans and of African Americans. What the author never brought up is that it, it was a Catholic priest who was made a bishop who sent a report of the degradation of the African slaves and Native American slaves to Pope Paul III. And Pope Paul III, in 1536, wrote a resounding condemnation of slavery of anybody, not because they are white, Native American, or African, but because they have reason and free will and therefore have human dignity given them by God. And it's on that principle. Many of his predecessors had already put the slave trade under automatic excommunication. Eugene, Martin V, Eugene IV, Pius II, and so on. They'd, it was recur and would again recur throughout history, but Paul III realized what was at stake, and he did it on the basis of the inherent dignity of humans from Africa, America, and Europe and Asia having reason and free will. And that gets omitted, and I f f fear that it will be undone by the kind of movement we see today. I, I think one thing that will be a surprise to a lot of readers of my book is how all the modern constitutional principles were developed in the Middle Ages, and specifically within the Catholic Church by canon lawyers, who of course were uh, reflecting the very truths that you just spoke to, that because all people are created equal, because they're rational creatures, they cannot be ruled without their consent. The requirement of consent in man's rule was first enunciated by the Catholic Church. And that's why it, it, uh, we, we have, we're flat running out of time. But it's important to know that it was St. Robert Bellarmine who gave the most cogent arguments against the divine right of kings on the basis of those Catholic principles. And Thomas Jefferson cited him in the Declaration of Independence and in, in uh, Bellarmine's dispute against King uh, James I. So it's, these things are important to know. And again, I want to remind people, the book is called America on Trial, A Defense of the Founding by Robert R. Riley. Again, EWTNRC.com, our religious catalog, has it. It is item 9489. I urge you to get this so that we can think through our Catholic criticism of any and all politicians and movements, etc. We're not endure. We don't endorse a, a party. We endorse Jesus Christ and His gospel. Robert, thank you again for being with us, and I'm going to give my own blessing. May the Lord bless you and all of our viewers and keep you strong in Christ and our faith and morality. May God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And again, we thank you for your ongoing support so we can bring 
these programs by great thinkers like Robert Riley and others. So keep us between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we will pay our bills too. Thank you, and God bless.